Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this symposium, Standard of Dwelling. Um, my name is uh, Hans Ibelings. I'm the moderator today. And uh, I presume I'm moderating because I'm an expert on housing, which is something I've been doing my whole life. And it's interesting to know that we have this very informed audience because we all have this experience in dwelling. We've been dwelling all our lives. And we have then a series of speakers today who are maybe even more knowledgeable about it. Program is fairly straightforward. We have three sessions, uh, three times a presentation by both an architect and a developer telling us about their joint experiences in one or more projects. And each of those short uh, sessions is followed by a kind of conversation here behind the table and a conversation which is open to use the audience as well. So whatever you have, pressing comments, questions, please address them right away. Feel free to join the conversation. And then after that, after those three sessions of uh, pairs of architects and uh, developers, we will have uh, a panel discussion with all the speakers today and then a break and in the evening a uh, lecture keynote lecture by Michael Martzan. Um, pretty straightforward. I'm not going to tell you uh, everything about speakers. You all have a program so you can see their bios and CV so you know who you will actually see in front of you. And uh, I would like to start right away with uh, the first session. Uh, Peter Clues and from Architects Alliance and uh, David Wax from Urban Capital and uh, they will give their presentation jointly or? Uh, singly. Singly. Look, that's telling. We're going to talk about that. Please. Hi. Hi. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to do the presentation, and then, uh, and then David and I will, I guess, do the follow-up Q&A. First of all, I want to say I think it's fantastic you're having this symposium. I've loved to say, I've said over and over in my career, because we do a lot of housing, that uh, housing really makes cities. Most design architects have a proclivity and an instinct to go after um, highbrow public sector institutional projects. And often housing is let, you know, left on the wayside. But it's really the fabric of the city, and it's what makes cities. And in the case of Toronto, we're going through an unprecedented change. This is uh, in the history of this city. We're adding um, such an extraordinary amount of construction at a time um, in our careers as architects and as citizens of the city, which is quite remarkable. But it's being done without any kind of coherent planning or zoning uh, regulatory framework. And it really, the antecedent to it is the 2005 Places to Grow program, uh, which was a provincial initiative to spawn intensification within major growth centers in Toronto, Toronto or Ontario rather, Toronto being the principal one, and forced the uh, city to change its official plan in 2005, but the city uh, was reluctant or failed to uh, implement the zoning that would follow as part of that normal process. And as a result, we have a planning department that's completely under siege, where we are essentially developing a city in an iterative way, uh, site by site. And it's, uh, it's not a great way to do a city, and it's, uh, it's, uh, but it's what we've got. And we do battle, and David does battle. My developer buddy here today, this is what we do for a living, really, is is advocate for uh, development and try and do it in a coherent and responsible way. Overlaid with this is there's, a, I would say, a kind of a cultural schism going on in, in concurrently in the city, which is the millennial generation and then everybody else. And uh, the millennial generation is largely the generation that is occupying the housing that we're building. They seem to be the ones that have embraced this notion of walking to work, living in a kind of a very dense village, and everybody else is very skeptical of the whole thing, imagines that uh, condominium construction is not a sustainable form of housing, that it's really here in a short-term basis, it's going to collapse soon, 
the uh, Toronto Dominion Bank is famous in the la every year for the last eight years saying there's going to be a 20% correction in the, in the condominium uh, uh, market. Um, if uh, they were correct, we would be giving them away for free now. Um, and of course, all is manifest to tremendous challenges as practitioners and as developers. The principal one being political, that we have lay people, which are our, our, our uh, uh, elected uh, politicians, councillors, who are in the unfair position of having to judge and adjudicate on every single application. And as I said, they're lay people, they're generalists, they're meant to in part, depending upon your perspective of participatory democracy, represent the, the will of their constituency. And it's a very, very difficult process. And to say nothing of the economic and realities of doing these projects, Toronto is a hyper, hyper competitive market. We're building middle class housing, entry level middle class housing. And it presents great challenges from an architectural perspective. <clears throat> So because I tend to be a bit of a contrarian, I'm not going to present one project. I'm going to present nine in about 10 minutes. And I want to do that because I want to give you an overview of really what's going on in the city right now. And it's really three principal areas of practice that we're engaged in. The downtown, and largely it's being characterized by the point tower. And um, this is a concerning um, kind of morphology, I think not in of itself, but because the entire downtown has been considered as appropriate for point towers. And that the city, what they have done is so codified morphologically these buildings were getting generic buildings one after another that are all the same height, they're all the same floor plate size, and on and on. Uh, but I want to show you two or three examples of point towers that I think were appropriate and are done for, for very specific reasons urbanistically and culturally. The second are what I call the railway seams. These are the kind of the newfound territories within Toronto that kind of snake through the city. And these are often at the edges of neighborhoods with vestigial industrial um, land uses and, and are turning out to be the kind of great hope for some diversity in housing that we thought would we get on the avenues. And it seems we were getting a far more creative response on the, these areas. And the last is, I would call the, the waterfront in the, in the future city under the tutelage of Waterfront Toronto. Where do we see our city going in the future? In all of these, ex all of these projects, we try and hit in our office um, on, on a series of uh, themes, really starting with the reinterpretation of the dwelling unit, what it means, how does it manifest, manifest itself in a particular project, the provision of amenity, how do you make beautiful places to live, an architectural vocabulary that's both compelling and appropriate to its site and its, and, and its program. A convincing and urbane response to density. We have a, a city that is kind of not too sure about this kind of density and how do we deploy it within the city. And finally, how do we enrich the public realm with these buildings? That it is a privilege, not a, not a right to build in this city, whether you're an architect or a developer. And we have to be really focused, I think, on the public realm. And that's why uh, symposiums like this are really, really important. So I'll just start with, uh, this is a project called ICE um, at the foot of uh, York Street. And I think what's very interesting about this project is this is, in a way, the new city. This is the modern city as uh, the modernists would have imagined at Toronto at the, at the kind of the early 60s when Mies came to town with the, with the uh, TD Center, a series of towers and uh, public squares and broad sidewalks. And in a way, we've created this hyper-dense city, which I think is very interesting because it's very different from the rest of Toronto. And we don't have any of these kind of silliness of deferential podiums uh, against uh, uh, existing buildings. It's, it's, it's a clean slate. These buildings are completely occupied. They're, they're no matter what you read in the popular media about who are buying condos in Toronto. This is a project of almost 1,000 units. It's completely inhabited. It's owned by a series of investors and end users. But principally, the, the, uh, the residents in these buildings are the millennial generation, those that want to walk to work. They're not interested in driving or taking the GO train from Georgetown or wherever 
how our previous generation decided to, uh, to live. Um, and it really operates on two scales, down at the street and at the skyline. This is a photograph from these wonderful bloggers that uh, break into these buildings illegally at night. And uh, it's very heroic, and I really love it. And I, this photograph, to me, typifies exactly what's happening in this section of the city, this kind of interlacement and intertwining of the, of the transportation infrastructure of the city that we, we, we was so reviled for so many years. Um, and then, as I said, this kind of interlacement and insertion of buildings around it, you get this kind of crazy, um, delirious city. This is a, another point tower. Um, unfortunately, it's, it's done or almost done. I don't have uh, photographs. It hasn't been yet photographed. It's called Theater Park. What's interesting about this project was that it, it sits in an almost completely intact 19th century block on the north side of King Street. To the, uh, to the left is the Royal Alex Theater. This was before the Gary approval, which I've gone on public record thinking I, saying I think it's a bit insane. But, this one, <clears throat> the idea was to insert density within this block, but do it in a deferential way and to create new public space adjacent to the Royal Alex Theater. So we raised the building up, we pushed it back, and um, created a forecourt that's publicly accessible. I just took a photograph this morning of, of the podium condition of it. <clears throat> and it is a, it's, a pro, it's a building that has all range of unit types from very small units, kind of um, first-time buyers and renters, up to very large commodious um, units on the roof and, or the upper sort of 15 floors. And so it really does represent a microcosm of the housing market of those that are really interested in living downtown. The last point tower is a series or projects, a series of uh, towers that we did in the distillery. And the distillery district is an interesting interesting uh, precinct in the sense that if, if you were not from Toronto and you saw this photograph, you would wonder what are those towers doing within this kind of the morphology of this section of the city. And it's a very good question. And this was an historic district that was bought by uh, Dundee, Kilmer, and others a number of years ago. And as part of that um, acquisition, they inherited the uh, density rights that the city granted on this district to incentivize the district to be re-inhabited and redeveloped. It had been a kind of an abandoned industrial zone for almost 40 years. And um, so this site with these two towers was imagined to be a million square foot office building. As they imagined there would be a go station at, um, at Cherry and, um, and the, rail line, the uh, rail line at this location. That didn't happen, and so the program was changed, and it was how do we depose a million square feet in an historic district in the form of housing as opposed to office. So this is what we chose to do. And so the, the idea of the point tower here was to make a very clear distinction between what is kind of the base condition of the laneways and alleyways of the, dis, of the, of the district, both the historic buildings, and really, most importantly, I think it's the spaces between those buildings that are most significant. And then this kind of upper level of the insertion of this density so that the point tower was something that uh, worked quite effectively here. And it also gives extraordinary amenity to the people that live there in terms of this notion of that you'll see in a repeating theme of our work of wraparound <coughs> balconies, where it visually extends um, the size of the unit and provides an amenable kind of interstitial space between indoors and outdoors. Now I want to go to um, the last tower. This is a project we've, it's under construction with, uh, with David. It's called a Smart House. And uh, this is just right here on a, a, actually a very curious and privileged location on the uh, kind of the eastern edge of Queen Street West as it meets University Avenue. And um, the challenge here was how do we do housing that is affordable and accessible to the, this kind of a millennial demographic in a very, very expensive site in a very kind of privileged location in the city. And so we chose to essentially really rethink the idea of a dwelling unit. 
and, and study all of the components of the units, uh, principally the kitchens and the bathrooms, which were often considered as fixed elements and all you could really move around were the size of bedrooms and living rooms, and, and really start to imagine how you could combine um, elements and spaces such as storage into single kind of um, enclosures, such as a kitchen that basically is everything. <clears throat> and um, so these are extraordinarily small units. They're very, very successful. Um, we hope they'll, people will love living there. It's yet to be built. And, um, but it really speaks again to this kind of uh, tremendous change going on demographically in the city in which this generation really wants to live downtown and they want to actually participate in the life of the city. And so what we are starting to see is all of the insertion of this residential density is really bringing vitality and life to many parts of the city in, in terms of street life that had previously hadn't been there. In terms of the rail scene, we're doing two buildings. These are interesting because they're not towers. Uh, this one is on Sororan, which is um, just on the eastern edge of High Park. And what's interesting about this area, again, it's, it's, a, it's a rail seam adjacent to a beautiful residential neighborhood. Uh, people who want to live here can't afford the houses there. They've been kind of priced out of their market. The privilege, if you're lucky enough, you probably bought 15 or 20 years ago. And so what we're looking for here is affordable housing that, that, that kind of bridges this this, this scene between the rail lines and the, in, in the neighborhood, a way that recalls the industrial heritage, but also does it in a kind of a reinterpretation. So this is a notion of a kind of a carved brick box that's floated up, and, and as I said, recalls a bit of the industrial vernacular, but does so in a fairly playful um, way. Across the rail scene, we're doing a um, um, a new museum for uh, um, MOCA. And uh, what's very interesting about this project is it's how, again, housing can actually leverage cultural development. So in the case of MOCA, they were looking for a new home. They chose the warehouse, which is right here, just to the, uh, to the right of this image. And um, the residential density that's, that's been granted is as a part of a rezoning, a comprehensive zoning of this whole precinct, is in part providing a subsidy for MOCA to go into this building and inhabit it. So there's this kind of synergistic relationship between providing a cultural amenity and then using that cultural amenity as a kind of a marketing and a way to drive people into what is a kind of a, a vestigial no man's land right now. So I think it's a, it's a kind of a very interesting case study. And uh, something that uh, well, I know Daniels does with um, art space and, uh, and other um, uh, cultural users and that the city could use more of. And in, in the case of this building in particular, we're very interested in studying the idea of um, outdoor rooms, looking at the, the notion of a dwelling unit and saying, well, can we create a kind of a, a, a semi-private outdoor space as well as a, as a more conventional balcony? And so hence this kind of screen idea. The final set of slides are on what I call the future city. So the first was a project we did a number of years ago. It's still being complete. It's the longest running, I think, construction project in the history of Toronto. I hope uh, my client isn't here to hear this. But um, this was a project that uh, we inherited with an intact uh, zoning of a million and a half square feet with a series of U-shaped buildings that are all inflected towards the water and at a maximum height of 14 stories. And so we were charged with the, the, the challenge of how do we kind of take that as a right density and redeploy it on the site in a way that has much more amenity both for the public in terms of access to the water, visual and, and physical access to the water, um, as well as for the folks that will live there, to, that they can both participate in living on the water, but also look back to the city and, and this kind of remarkable position that this site has and others have, that often the views back to the city are more 
powerful in the views to the, to the lake beyond. And it also was a challenge given that um, there's a fully functioning, which is kind of interesting, a fully functioning um, industrial user in the form of red past sugar to the east, and they put all sorts of series of, of uh, uh, restrictions on the site. One of them was that we had to do what they called a blinder building, so that no one was allowed to look at their facility. We actually had to build a wall here to stop the promenade, which in, we hope in the future will eventually be removed. But it's, it's a bit like, well, we're over here. We don't want any disturbance. So we get this kind of juxtaposition of new uses against old uses. So the idea here was to actually create a series of finger buildings and then lift some of the density up above and then create these kind of visual and functional corridors down to the lake. So this is only the first phase. There's a whole phase in front of this. This is all just temporary here, uh, yet to be built out to Queen's, to, uh, uh, Queen's Key, rather. And, um, and again, it's, a, it's an interesting project from a housing perspective in that um, it, uh, it creates a broad, kind of a wide variety of housing types, um, from small units to large units to really extraordinary penthouse units that are through units that look back to the city and to the water. So I think from that perspective, it's a pretty interesting project. I'm sorry, but it hasn't been properly photographed. And this is the second phase where there's a small tower kind of is interlaced and emerges out of it. So I'm just going to finish on two final projects. One is the uh, Pan Am Athletes Village, which um, we were the architects in conjunction with uh, KPMB, Toronto, and uh, Rene Daou from Montreal, and MJM Miller, uh, MJM Architects, rather, from Toronto. And what's interesting about this project is in this dearth of, of planning framework and zoning framework in the downtown central area of Toronto, this came to us as a fully planned neighborhood. And it's probably the first fully planned neighborhood since St. Lawrence. And so based on that, I think it's interesting and it's also highly charged to see how effective it will be. And it's, it's kind of very early days. Um, it has only parts of it have been complete, so you can't really judge it yet. But it, uh, it points to a future as the city kind of moves towards the uh, lower Donlands and into the, uh, into the portlands of about how the city might actually develop in a much more coherent way, albeit in a dense way, but in a way that creates truly mixed-use neighborhoods and uh, beautiful streets and blocks. And so the, this project, um, <clears throat> it, it uses um, market housing as a way, it, partly as a, as a financial leverage, to put in a new community center, which is a new Y over here, um, a residence for George Brown um, College here, as well as two social housing projects here. So it provided a partial subsidy. There were also uh, government subsidies. But it is, a, it is a way, I think, to look at in the future of providing affordable housing in the city in a way that, that is effective and targeted and integrated into communities. That's the um, uh, student residence that we did for George Brown. And this is a project that's part of this uh, development that has not yet been built, but I think is an interesting building, again, typologically, because it's not a tower, which is a, a courtyard project in which um, we are looking at lining housing both on the outer and the inner side of the courtyard and linking those courtyards as a part of the public space network throughout the block so that people can actually go from courtyard to courtyard. So it's a bit like the Dutch housing block, but then it's opened up. <clears throat> and finally, I'm going to focus, uh, uh, end on a project that's not the work of our office, but it's the work of David's uh, development company. Uh, River City. And what I think is really quite compelling about this project, one is its location. It's again, it's just beside uh, the Pan Am Village project. It's, um, it's in this really interesting uh, landscape of this Gordian knot of, of the Don River and the Gardner Expressway and Lakeshore Boulevard and the rail lines. And um, 
who would have ever thought that you could actually do a compelling neighborhood here? And David won the competition because he was absolutely fascinated, and you can talk about it, uh, the location. And he hired an architect. And, and David is, you know, I debate a lot about uh, condominium architecture in Toronto, and David likes to refer to it as the Toronto condominium style. And there is a kind of a generic quality to a lot of the housing that's going on in Toronto right now. And what's it, partly because it's codified morphologically through the, through the planning um, guidelines, it's also all targeting the same market largely, the same economic market. We're all using the same facade suppliers and builders, and pretty soon you get the same thing. And uh, so this is uh, Sassi and Parat from Montreal, who took all those same kind of uh, constraints and ran it through their own language. And I, and I think it's, it's both um, a compelling set of buildings, and there's a third one yet to come, but also it's, it's focus on execution, which is so often forgotten in residential construction. Um, it's, it's remarkable, and it's, it's both uh, a tribute to them and to David that, um, that um, and that's why I invited David to be my developer buddy today, because it's, uh, there are very few developers that would actually go this far, and there's a real commitment here in terms of the quality of the project. How it relates kind of on the edge of the city and the water, and then how it starts to create a very dense precinct and neighborhood within. So I'm just going to end on that and open it up. After hearing everything from you, maybe you could tell us something about your perspective on dwelling and uh, the city and how it's developing. Um, okay. I, uh, maybe I'll start with tell, saying just a little bit about uh, me <laughs> and urban capital or what our vision is or my vision is. So we've been around urban capital since the late 90s. And I think if I could look at it uh, a bit about what is my intention in doing development or maybe retrospectively what I've done is, if I could sum it up, I think it's been so far bringing urban living options to Canadian cities. So uh, when, we, when I started out in the 90s, like, no, one really, we, no one really lived downtown and certainly no one lived in the areas where we've ended up developing. And uh, a lot of people would say that's because there's no demand. I've always... Uh, question that. Uh, and we started off with a project called Camden Lofts in the heart of the fashion district, which was dire at the time. And since then, I think what we've done is brought um, an really interesting urban developments to cities that have never really had them before. So Toronto did have some, obviously it wasn't bereft of them, but something like Camden Lofts was pretty out there back in the day. And then we would, uh, after we did Camden Lofts and another little project nearby, before all the huge developers came and started building in that neighborhood. Uh, we also went to Ottawa. And, uh, and when we went to Ottawa, people, you know, when we went to start in Toronto in 96, people said, you know, it's not New York. When we went to Ottawa, they said, you know, it's not Toronto. <laughs> and uh, it did phenomenally. Uh, again, same concept, bringing urban living, cool urban living, affordable. I always explain, I was just in the Philadelphia on Monday, and uh, the way I explain my product in, uh, to people who don't know it is, it's like an Audi A3. It's not the A4, it's not the A5, it's not a, you know, it's not a Malibu. Um, and uh, I think that really sums it up. So bringing that thing to Ottawa, again, people were like, no one, no one drives an A A3 in Ottawa, certainly back then, <coughs> but they did, they loved it. Then we went to Montreal, which I always say, no one actually cares what happens in Toronto and Ottawa when you're in Montreal. And, uh, but again, it was a huge success because you're selling urban living for an affordable price with a really interesting design. And then after that, we went to cities like Winnipeg, which has been possibly my Waterloo, because Winnipeg has um, issues beyond a simple solution of a condominium development. Uh, we went to Halifax, where we did phenomenally well again, building right next to the rail line uh, in a location that people thought wouldn't happen. And now. We're expanding to other super big Canadian cities like Saskatoon and St. John's. And, but in all of those cities, uh, there's never been an urban living option or a cool urban living option. It just doesn't exist. But there, there's, there, there's a big demand for it, at least I hope. Uh, and um, so 
I think a big picture thing is that, that we have been trying to bring really creative urban living concepts to Canadian cities. And I'll just as an aside, I don't know, does anyone here know Urban Splash in the UK? No, come on. I do. Uh, so, Hans does. Yeah. <laughs> so a bit like, I, I sort of model what I do on Urban Splash, because they've done fantastic buildings in places like Bradford or you know, north of Manchester. And uh, I feel like we, that's something that I find is a really uh, a bit of a noble endeavor, at least for me. Uh, the other thing that we bring, and we've been, I think, on the forefront of, is contemporary design. So you wouldn't think it today, but if you go back to the late 90s, people were building, like, I can't remember what it's called, on Lawrence up near the ravine, like that faux. And, <laughs> no, they did that too. Um, the fake uh, Tudor, uh, I can't remember the name of the project, but it was really Chetting Cheddington. Cheddington. Like, you could imagine if, if, if people like Peter didn't get involved, the whole city would look like the Sheddington. Like, that's really possibly what could have happened. <laughs> Might have been nice. <laughs> it's like, so, you know, we bring things <coughs> like, uh, in, even the interior design moves we talk about with lots of light and space. Sometimes uh, Lane Ciccone always refers to it as um, three-dimensional versus uh, two-dimensional space. But things that were quite radical, first in Toronto and now in uh, these other cities. And architecture that... I would say is, is tries to be responsive to its site, but not you know, slavishly so. So River City is, in fact, quite responsive to its site. It, you might have thought at the time there, there was nothing to respond to, but in fact, as Peter alluded to, there was a huge amount to respond to. And I think we won that uh, opportunity because, of, um, because we em absolutely embraced the location in our documents we submitted. We, 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 I remember standing on that, um, the ramps and photographing the West Onlands in like the total barren abyss that it was in the middle of winter. And now we did a double spread in our, uh, in, in our submission. And we just said, this is awesome, and this is what we're going to do here. So uh, I would say bringing urban living to downtown locations uh, or urban locations, uh, contemporary design, environmental sustainability. I wouldn't overplay that. We're not superstars on that, but we keep it in, in mind. And we've done a number of lead buildings. Uh, before everyone's done now a lead building or so, but I think we were, excuse me, a little bit on the harbinger of that, the leading edge. And I'm just going uh, to stop talking about me in a second, but one of the things that I do tell people that I, I it's kind of my rule for development, is what I call the 80% rule. I, I aim for all our projects, for everything I do, everyone that touches to be 80% happy. I, I feel that if someone is 100% happy, they... Um, someone is going to be 0% happy. So we think that you know, the architects, the city staff, uh, the purchasers, our investors, everyone should be 80% happy. And then that, if, if we achieve that, then I think. So that's kind of, um, that's kind of uh, I guess, where <coughs> we're here, and maybe possibly why I've been invited here. I think we've, we have been leaders in, um, uh, in residential development. Not just in Toronto, and that's the thing. Like, we're not, certainly not one of the biggest, I think, uh, in this city. But if you look at us, we've now built about 4,000 condos, but spread over a number of cities. Uh, I, I will say a couple of things about Smart House. Smart House uh, was a solution to a problem. I mean, really, uh, we paid way, way, way too much for that site, way too much. Uh, we bought it at a time when um, things were frothy, and by the time we closed, it had been quite a dip, and we had to get 800 bucks a, a foot, had to, to make it work. And what, and I'm going to mention in a second, because one of the proponent, <coughs> protagonists in this story is here, but what we decided to do was turn this problem into a little bit of a solution by going with super, super small units, uh, and uh, in order to get the price, the, the, the absolute price, not the price point, not the dollar per square foot price, but the price down to an affordable range. So the proposition could be, hey, live at Queen and University for $225,000. It was once live at University and Queen for $99,000, but those days had, like when I started out. But uh, so to make that proposition work, we had to, of course, make smaller units. Uh, and two things came from this. One is it was an opportunity to, what I say is like, press the reset button on condominium design. So over the last 10 years, mm -hmm. the condominiums have become obviously incredibly smaller. If you can believe it, this is insane, but in Camden Loss, there is a one-bedroom unit that is 950 square feet. It is a 950 square foot one-bedroom, okay? It is immense. Uh, and now a one-bedroom, if, it, if, it, if it, the number starts with six, it is unsellable, right? We cannot afford it. So over the years, 
five now. Five, true, <laughs> five. Tomorrow, by now, because tomorrow will be four. Um, one of the things that happened is over the years, you will notice that if you looked at floor plans, uh, units got smaller, but the two main elements of them, which is your kitchen and your bathroom, stayed the same until they absolutely ate up. Your, your washing machine is larger than your bedroom, right? Your dishwasher <laughs> is larger than your bedroom. Because, first of all, large dishwashers are cheap and affordable, so you always put them in. So what we noticed was these units were insane, like half your unit was your kitchen. So we went to first principles and we designed everything from scratch. And I think that in doing so, uh, we really pushed the envelope because I think more developers came to our sales office than purchasers for the first two months. <laughs> uh, but we really pushed the envelope in terms of design. And the, and the photo that Peter showed you, which is awesome, which by the way is uh, I think 12 photos stitched together because the space that, that kitchen was photoed in had a wall right behind it. So it's a fantastic photo. Uh, but why did, why did, I'll tell you, one of the reasons why um, Smart All sold so well, and we sold 252 out of 256 units or something like that, I, I'm not even exaggerating. Uh, the reason it sold well is because of the dishwasher. <laughs> because people would pull the dishwasher out of the thing and it was a drawer. And their faces would light up, and they'd go, I, I want one of these, right? <laughs> so it's like, it's true, I was there. So, you know, <laughs> no, it's true. And, and Eve Lewis, and I'm going to come to the second, Eve Lewis here, she, she, her sales team was good too, as an aside. <laughs> but yeah, but uh, all the dishwasher. other interesting thing about this was the process of going to market with it, because we had to get these small units, and they were well-designed and stuff, but, you know, honestly, $250,000 for 320 square feet, it's insane. So we decided in our meetings, like, what are we going to do about this? And my, proponent, I, my proposition, along with Eve Lewis, against some of the other more conservative people on our team, was we have to celebrate this smallness. We have to absolutely, absolutely do this campaign about small is great, right? So we had, like, Napoleon and... Uh, I had a whole bunch of little things, um, you know, like, <laughs> great amazing little things. So uh, it was a huge success, a huge success. And now we're building it. And um, I am very curious, very, very curious to see what it's going to look like uh, when it's done. Uh, I am, I am, I am. <laughs> so, you know, we also started with furniture. No one really bought the furniture. But I think what has to make these spaces is the holistic approach to it. So SmartOS was one of our biggest successes. Uh, and it was really born out of, you know, a, um, a challenge. So I think that's it. That's Thank you very much. This 80% uh, happiness rule, yeah. um, did it also apply to your collaboration with uh, Peter? I think Peter's 80%. No, I'm only 70. <laughs> <Peter's> yeah. 70. <laughs> no, but I don't want to turn this into a relational <laughs> therapy, but maybe you can tell something about your collaboration. Are your uh, interests and aims aligned, or do you see some points of, let's say, disagreement? Uh, uh, no, I haven't had. To, I don't think we've had a disagreement yet. No. I would say Peter is one of the smartest guys I've come across. That's pretty. Well, I actually tell that to a lot of people. Not some other architects I know and I'm friends with, but um, I would say that uh, yeah, definitely, because uh, first of all, he's been a part. I don't know how. Like Peter does sometimes do his own development, so he understands the stresses uh, and the constraints. I told him yesterday for a building that he was designing for me, I said, I really have a problem because I spent too much money on it, on the land. And once again, he said, this sounds like a theme when you come to me. But um, <laughs> I'd say he's one of the smartest. And, uh, and his, I, I'm a big fan of his uh, elegant, simple design. Hmm? I, always, I also say that you know, because he's so, his success has been one, now one of his problems because it's, Peter Clues is everywhere. <laughs> And then Thank from you. the other side, Peter? I'm sorry? Can you say something about this? Yeah. Peter, please being a The stress, let's say, possible um, tension between developing and uh, designing? Well, it, yeah. I mean, what I, it, this is not meant to be a love in between David and I, but <laughs> the, what I admire about David is that, uh, um, that is often not found in most development clients is the importance of design. And um, it's not that he won't, you know, quote, value engineer, but he actually, it's very important to him in terms of his own self-identity that the, the buildings that he does, he can be proud of architecturally and urbanistically. And that's, that's very unusual. 
One thing that struck me in your presentation is you talked about floor plans, but you didn't show anything. Yeah. So it was mainly exteriors of buildings. Um, so maybe I can ask the question to both of you. How do you see this uh, standard of dwelling? Well, you accepted the invitation, so you must have an idea of what the standard of dwelling is, without any article, so standard of dwelling. Uh, and maybe related to the absence of uh, floor plans and interiors um, in your presentation. But what do you mean by what do you mean by that question? I'm I'm just wondering what <clears throat> standard of dwelling means to you. What, what what's your standard? Or what should be the new standard? Or what should be the new standard? Yeah, yeah I, standards. What what I was trying to say was that in my presentation was that I think that uh, there is housing is a commodity. It all, has always been multi-unit housing has always been a commodity. It is. It's meant to provide, in any civilized society, we have affordable housing in our cities. And the way, in part, that we do that is through commoditization. So there's repetitive building systems, repetitive, you know, all of the stuff that goes in with, with multi-unit housing. The idea is to try and then take that housing, in the case of Toronto, because we're, or, or we're overlaying a city, this kind of tidal wave of housing coming through, and reinventing and rebuilding a city. Mm -hmm. And how do we take that housing yeah. and really redefine the public realm and engage that housing with, with the city, make it a better city? Mm -hmm. So that's what I think the standard of dwelling should be. So it's less about the dwelling itself? Less about more the about actual the unit. Yeah. Although you know, I, I could lecture for four hours on how to design a unit plan. It's actually very difficult. Um, <clears throat> and all the nuances and dimensional um, issues that you you um, that uh, you encounter, and then you do it long enough, it becomes second nature to you. Mm -hmm. When you first start with it, you, you think it's an impossible uh, situation. And if you had asked me uh, five years ago, would we be doing uh, one bedrooms below 500 square feet, I would have laughed. If you had asked me, you know, now I'd say we can do uh, one bedrooms under 300 square feet. Except, I mean, for, the new, except for the new barrier free. Yeah, the new barrier free. Like, we're really hitting the limit of space um, and dimension requirements under the building codes. And beyond that, it's about how do we combine the interior of these units in a way that's both commodious and compelling, mm -hmm. but then works within the larger picture of the city. And I think that that's the big challenge. So in that respect, the standard of dwelling is a small one? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, well, then I think it's... Um, Yes. I, partly how we won the um, Pan Am competition, that was a developer-builder uh, competition, was that, and they told us this after the fact, we made three or four design presentations. There were, I think we were competing with three other teams. And these were really high pressure presentations. They were going at frequency of every two months. And it was our second or third presentation when I got up and I start. maybe that's the lecture I should have given. <laughs> and I just presented unit plans. Uh -huh. And I said that, uh, that the whole project comes down to this unit. And I, they, they had done a whole precinct plan and decided the, the, the dimension of uh, width of blocks. And they had put in prototypical buildings and said, OK, each developer, this is what we, you want, we want you to build. Come back with your design and, and the price that you offer to build it for, and, and we'll pick a winner. And so it seemed to me the way to win this was the, the, the firm that, bought, that built the least amount of density, because that would require the least amount of provincial subsidy, if you follow me. So they wanted to build a, an athlete's village for 10,000 athletes. So they needed a certain amount of beds. And so we worked, it was this elaborate kind of puzzle of, 10,000 beds equals how many units? <clears throat> and so then we became very clever about how many athletes you could put in a bedroom using bunk beds, looking at all the rules of the, the Olympic housing rules, <clears throat> and then how we could do units that were detuned. They didn't have kitchens in them. They didn't have finishes, just a modicum of, of partitions and bunk beds. But most importantly, it was all underpinned by the unit. And what we did was we said, look, your precinct plan is all wrong, that you should be doing wide, shallow courtyard buildings, not uh, long, deep shotgun units, and that what you should be doing is turning the unit this way. 
if you turn it 90 degrees, you can carve about 30% of the area of the unit out. And if you look at the housing market in Toronto, the average sale price is this. And if you did your unit, you get, you know, I did all these figures. Maybe that's the lecture. I <laughs> Come back to where money. it was like five hundred and fifty dollars yeah. a square foot, and if you went like this, you could yield eight hundred dollars a square foot. So it, it's it's this almost arithmetical calculation that's imbued, embedded into all of this residential development that is not about architecture, but it's about the logistics of the building, which makes it very complicated. I have one more question. Oh, you want to say something? Yeah, Please. on the standard of yeah. standard of unit. Yeah. One thing that I think has allowed us to go to these other cities without being there all the time and to make it work is that I do actually have developed a standard. I have a standard um, spec. So every time we have a question now about everything from the height of the light switch to how big the bedroom is going to be, what is the, what is the sliding door track, what I have actually produced this, uh, an urban capital spec, and it's like, guys, I, 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 and also, we don't, have, um, we don't have, in these other cities where I've gone to local architects, uh, planning sessions of units. I tell them, uh, go to this website, see this unit, put this unit in here, put this unit in here. It all lays out. And um, so that is how uh, we have, I have standardized a product that I like. And, and everything that, you know, everything that has screwed up over the years has been actually noted. Not that it's perfect, it still screws up. but. I think one of the things, when Peter is right, for us, the unit is a bit of a commodity. Mm -hmm. And we have a standard design, and that allows us to do things in other cities and <coughs> other markets with our design. Rather than the more traditional approach, which is that you're in one market, and every one of your buildings is a little different, and you hire an interior designer to do that, it's kind of a bit of the opposite for me. I have one more question for you. You can think about it for a moment, which is, uh, what we should discuss in the panel later on. So what's really a kind of pressing issue you want to address later on with all the other speakers. And maybe now this moment for you in the audience before we round up this discussion to add something, comments, remarks, questions. Yes, over there. You get a microphone. Hello. Um, I'm wondering what you think uh, the implications of these um, kind of shrinking unit sizes have on meeting the needs of an aging population? Because you say um, that it does meet the barrier-free requirements of the building code, but I'm wondering if you think that's enough? Um, and perhaps more thoughts on what, how you think that current um, housing development or perhaps past can be improved to meet um, greater need for housing for the elderly. And um, yeah. Uh, is, uh, is that to me, sorry, or to Peter? To, to two of you, maybe? Yeah, either. <laughs> so I'll, I guess I'll go first. Um, I don't think our, what we produce is geared to the needs of the elderly at all. It's not. It's not designed by people. We, we don't think about that. I mean, this is the truth. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so there. That's it. Next I question. mean, whether good or bad, yeah. you know, um, it's it's very tough because um, it's it can't be something for everyone, right? And uh, you have to hit a price point. And so, at this stage of my life, although it's probably getting a little closer to the stage where. Uh, <laughs> I have not designed with that market in mind and or that need in mind. So I'm sorry. That's the truth. <laughs> well, I, what I, I've often thought about this because I had uh, aging parents. And you have the uh, dilemma of what happens to them. Do they go into a facility? Um, or do they move in with you? And um, I was able to dodge the moving in with me a couple of times, uh, but very nearly. We, it, with, um, with both my parents, we, we, um, we actually made the offer, and they chose not to. But I, I think, I imagine when I'm elderly, what I would like is a situation in which I feel engaged in a community and that I have assistance when I need it. So 
the, the most remarkable thing would be, and I, I have a client who, uh, Sam Criano, I, I'm, I'm fond of telling the story where he developed a condominium building downtown Toronto. And uh, his daughter also lives, he lives at the top. His daughter lives in the building, and his, one of his sons lives in the building. They have family and they have children. And they get together, you know, for Friday night dinners or whatever. But it's like the building is a community. It's like a, an extension of their network. Uh, he, he does joke about how they bring their laundry up to his unit to do it while they come for dinner. He doesn't quite understand. But if you could have a, 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 almost like a co-housing relationship like that where um, as your parents are aging, let's say, they could live close by, let's say, in the same building. Uh, so there's some semi-independence, but, um, but also assistance when required. And th I mean, th then there's the whole idea about aging in place and all the kinds of design and facilities that you might need within a, a unit itself. But what we don't do uh, well in this city that we need to think about, and it's actually interesting to me that Waterfront Toronto is thinking about this, is that Toronto uh, builds almost exclusively as a shear wall form of construction. And um, what that does is, is it really dramatically limits the interconnection of units over time. So it's much more of a European idea of living in apartment buildings than a North American idea. And that apartment buildings take on a life of their own uh, over the years and units get combined. I have a friend who lives in Paris and owns this bizarre interconnected unit that goes over two floors. It's three units combined. And that kind of thing would be facilitated if, we, if it was mandated to have columns as opposed to shear walls. So all the projects on waterfront Toronto's land are meant to be column structures to imagine the possibility of future conversion. So, I just, I just want to say one, come back to one thing. Uh, what um, stuff that, that there's one small point and a little bit of a bigger point. Mm -hmm. If someone comes into our sales office and it happens all the time and they're disabled or they're, um, they're, they're looking for, forward to what, they're looking ahead to what, you, you know, an aging in the space, there is a package of things that we do. Uh, so there is, you know, grab bars or ready, getting ready for grab bars in bathrooms. There's some kitchen modifications. But the bigger picture is that it, the, Peter said, and it's true, that there's a very, very competitive market in this city especially. And so all these, something like that to prepare every unit to be ready for that or to prepare every unit to, for every kind of condition possible will drive costs to the point where we're, we're facing an affordability uh, crisis right now. Not like other cities, but we have an affordability issue, which is a feature of being a successful city. But uh, no one believes this, but it is true that uh, it is not because the developers are suddenly taking home this immense amount of money. Very, very competitive city with many, many forces in the city looking to the development community to solve problems. Uh, and so that just does have a result of, of increasing prices for everyone. So to a certain extent, there, if there could be uh, types of developments that are catered towards that stage of life, and I know that uh, Sergio Scaramella, who is the editor, or the publisher of Azure sent me recently a, uh, prop, a proposal uh, that he saw of a building. Well, he wanted to get into a line of business and wanted to know my view of it, which was the type of housing that Peter just talked about. Communitive, communi community based uh, um, living for people who are in their 60s, not their 80s, but in their 60s, where uh, you have independence, but you can also share spaces with your, your friends and you do this together. It's very interesting. And, and as more people get into that demographic, it, there is probably a role for it. I think there was one more question there, yeah? And then you have to answer what's the pressing issue we have to address in the panel. Hi, David and Peter. My name is Stephen. I work at Maine and Maine. A question uh, about hiring architects or being hired by a client. How do you evaluate which architect you want to use for a site? And if you haven't used someone before, how do you choose them? And then Peter, how do you like to be hired? Uh, what, what works and what doesn't work when you're approached by a developer? I'm very interested to hear how David's <laughs> going to answer this. Um, I have kind of a list. And as pro a list of people I'd like to work with, and then as projects come up, I kind of go down the list. How does someone new get on the list? That's what the first 
<coughs> how you get on the list. Send them favors. <laughs> Yeah, it's not, um, well, I'd say that um, if you've done something interesting, you might get on, you might get, like if you've done something interesting, you know, and you've been published or you've done a good building or something like that and you haven't been used by lots of other people. So like right now, it's too late for me to go hire someone like Big. Or, uh, you know, there's a few new, not that I, you know, Sociate Parat, when I hired, going outside of the box for me was Sociate Parat. And I, I knew they were the right, I always wanted to hire them. I knew they were the right um, firm for this site because of their aesthetic. Uh, and I remember when we were going after this thing with Waterfront Toronto, my business partner was like, so say prod, who, who the hell is that? I'm like, that's a stupid idea. And I was like, <laughs> but in fact, uh, the people, because they weren't really known in Toronto, but the truth is that they were known by Waterfront Toronto's uh, design people and they were the right. So they just fit with this. And I have, you know, I would have loved to have hired 54621 barcode guys five years ago, but I didn't have a project. And uh, when I went to Winnipeg, uh, I actually didn't end up hiring them because Winnipeg is such, uh, like already bringing a regular glass box type building from Toronto into Winnipeg was crazy. And to hire them for, an, so it depends on the market and depends on who's out there, but. Um, oh, Peter's yeah. answer. Um. I, I would like to uh, be paid really well, <laughs> so we can do a really good job. The problem, um, my greatest frustration, I think this should be a conversation for the panel, because I think it is uh, it's a huge, huge topic facing this city and going forward in the next five years, is the amount of time that we spend on approvals. And uh, so I'm just going to use that, your question, as a segue okay. into this. Excellent. Um, that we, as I said in my, my, my little uh, talk, that, uh, that the planning department is under siege and we, we're, we're zoning every uh, site individually, site by site by site, without a larger vision of what we're trying to create as a city. And um, the planning department felt that they could handle this through a development permit system, which for various reasons is unlikely to happen in the city. And so they've now come up with a, a, a stealth bomb. And, and that's, a, they're going to designate the entire downtown Toronto as a historic conservation district. <laughs> this is their latest weapon. And we're, they're going to start to control development based upon its relationship between the kind of the scattered shot collection of uh, designated buildings that we have in the city, which is a very terrible way to plan the city. And we need to have more conversations about what kind of city we want to build and as opposed to this kind of reactionary uh, system that we're in where we're advocating for one thing and the city's looking at us skeptically and it becomes this ridiculous endless conversation and negotiation about, it's not even now just about the height of buildings, it's about the articulation, the facade. They'll say, well, uh, uh, Rob was saying to me this morning on a project we have, it's a, it's a mid-rise building on a main street, and uh, the comment was, well, we, we want to step, fine, okay, and then we want you to change the materials on the upper two floors of the building. This is the kind of conversation we're having, as opposed to what, is, what sort of city are we trying to create, and, and what definition of public realm, and how are these buildings giving back to the, to the city, you know, socially and culturally? <clears throat> Do you have anything to add to for the panel discussion, or shall we wrap up here? I would just like to yeah? say that we're in very, very big picture. If you stand back, like in 20 years, and look at this time, I think you will notice that we're in this odd moment in this city that involves people flowing in, but mostly it involves, from what I could tell, money flows, money flowing into Toronto, and uh, and what you're compelled to do if you take that money because people approach, I've been approached a few times recently with, you could do this to raise this amount of $25 million to $75 million uh, and, if, and many people are taking that money. And what happens when you take that money? Well, you, then you need to do something with it and you need to go and, and now buy a piece of property. And by the way, it's the number that you're buying it for is huge and prices that you sell are not going up in the city very much. So what happens? There's no money left for anything else. There's no money left for design, and there's really no money left for execution. So uh, 
I think that we are in this kind of weird situation where it's a bit unnatural. And it comes from, I think, partly from money flowing into the city. All right. Thank you very much, David Wex and uh, Peter Clues. We have a short break, and then we continue. <laughs> <coughs>